a little bit more about the history of segregation in Milwaukee. So uh, he wrote a really nice article on CNN's website about uh, segregation in Milwaukee featuring me. And as a result of that article on CNN's website, I started to get calls from lots of people about segregation. And I realized that I needed to learn more about it. Uh, and I wanted to learn more about it because there were a lot of things that uh, I knew about segregation in Milwaukee, but I wanted to be more specific in terms of the history of it. And so I started to put together um, research and with this idea of developing presentations about the history of segregation uh, in Milwaukee, how Milwaukee became the most segregated community. And what I found was that the same mechanisms that created segregation in Milwaukee created segregation around the country. And I'll share many of those with you tonight. Um, it's been an interesting journey for me. This is probably the 16th time I've done this presentation. I'm consistently adding more material as I learn more. Uh, I decided um, about two months ago to actually turn this into a book. So I'm actually working on a book about the history of segregation in Milwaukee and how we became the most segregated community. And it's been an eye-opening experience for me. There are a lot of things that I knew, uh, and there were some things that I knew that once I did more research, I found out that it wasn't exactly the way I thought it was. So there's a lot of information that I was able to um, come across uh, that I want to share with you all tonight about the history of segregation and how we became such a segregated uh, residential uh, community uh, in many places around the country. I think many of the things that were in place in Milwaukee and Chicago and Detroit and Los Angeles and Buffalo, New York and Cleveland, uh, all these different places, very similar mechanisms were in place uh, here in Racine as well. Uh, and it was a uh, concerted effort by specific groups of people to create segregation. It didn't happen accidentally. So I want to share that with you all tonight. So I am the head griot for America's Black Holocaust Museum. The museum founded uh, in 1988 by Dr. James Cameron, who survived a lynching in Marion, Indiana at the age of 16. Many of you have probably seen the image of his lynching. Uh, his two young friends, Abram Smith and Thomas Ship, were killed on that hot August day in Indiana. Uh, the, 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 the picture that was taken by a professional photographer by the name of George Breedler that day uh, became an international phenomenon. It was shared in newspapers around the world. Uh, carried this picture. In fact, the picture was so famous it led a young man to write a poem uh, that he called Strange Fruit about the lynching photograph in Marion, and that was eventually turned into a song which Billie Holiday made famous. A uh, young Jewish guy actually wrote the poem and it became this song. Uh, and it became a really big part of American history, but a part of American history where the story of what happened that day hasn't been shared with most people. Uh, people have seen the image of the two young men hanging from the tree and the, the large crowd of people standing in front, but they don't know that there were supposed to be three young black men hanging from that tree instead of only two. And the one who ended up surviving, he had the rope around his neck. He was being uh, taken out of the jail and beaten, uh, had objects thrown at him. Uh, people did all kinds of vicious things to him. Uh, he suffered injuries that remained uh, issues for him for the rest of his life. Uh, but he ended up surviving miraculously. Uh, he wrote a book about it called uh, Time of Terror, a Survivor's Story. And so I first met this man, James Cameron, back in 1994 after moving back to Milwaukee from California. And in 2002, I volunteered at his museum, uh, became one of the griots there. Griot is a term used in West Africa to describe the oral historians, the keepers of the history. And so I became one of those griots giving tours at the museum. I became the Saturday griot. I was there every Saturday from 2002 through 2008 when we ran out of money and were forced to close. My wife didn't necessarily like it at first, uh, but she got accustomed to it because she saw how much I enjoyed the interactions with our, you know, our visitors. Uh, during the course of this, I developed a very close relationship with uh, Dr. Cameron and his family. Uh, he became my mentor, and I learned a, a great deal from him about how to tell these stories. As a griot, uh, the tradition in West Africa is that you have to know the history of your community. And so that's the journey that I'm on, is learning the history of my community. Uh, 
because I think that in order to understand how we got to where we are, you have to look back in time and look at the journeys that people have been on to get to where we are. And so that's what I hope to do with you all tonight, is to take you on a journey to show you how residential segregation developed in the United States of America. So the museum's website, our virtual museum, which is on the screen, uh, www.abhmuseum.org. That's been online for about six and a half years now. It's been visited by over 200 countries. We had over the last seven and a half, eight months or so, three and a half million visitors to that website. Uh, it's been a great resource. Um, a city in Germany actually adopted one of our exhibits, our History of Jim Crow uh, exhibit. They translated it into German and they're actually using it to teach American history in classrooms in Germany uh, and it's in the textbooks in Germany. Uh, but you won't learn about the history of Jim Crow in schools in America, more than likely, which is very ironic. So, I've been involved with the museum since 2002. I became the head griot about a year after that. Started to train the other griots, and I've been doing speaking engagements, uh, workshops, things of that nature on behalf of the museum uh, for the last 15 plus years, and I love it. Uh, I love coming down here to Racine. I've done multiple talks on a variety of topics, and. I'm sure that you will see me again. I see lots of familiar faces, and it's always good to see you all come out. Those of you who haven't seen me before, uh, you will see me again, I can guarantee you. <laughs> so let me start with the presentation. We closed the physical museum in 2002 because we ran out of money. Uh, a dedicated group of us got together about seven years ago to kind of figure out how do we reestablish the museum. We started with the virtual museum online because it didn't require very much money. In fact, it required about $50 to get a website and get a host, and it's been very cheap to do that. Uh, we've uh, contracted with uh, local historians at UW Milwaukee, UW Madison, Alverno. Uh, Marquette University to write many of the exhibits on the website. Uh, it's a great resource. Uh, but we've been working on trying to build a new building. And we've been fortunate that a real estate developer, Melissa Goins Company, has decided to do a this development called the Grio Apartments. And they are currently working on building the new home to America's Black Holocaust Museum. They began tearing down the old building in April of this year, and they're making very good progress on building this new building on the footprint of the old building. And we're very excited about the opportunity to have a new physical home. And we started a new nonprofit called the Dr. James Cameron Legacy Foundation. So that consists of what the new building will be, our online museum, our virtual museum, our speakers bureau, which you know, we call it Griot to go, but it's really right now Reggie to go. Uh, but uh, we're hoping that grows over the course of time. We're excited about moving into the commercial space on the first floor of that building. The upper floors will be apartments. And um, it will be done probably late spring, early summer of next year. And I like to tell people that it will be occupied by us or someone else. Uh, if we are not able to raise the money that we need, it will be occupied by someone other than us. So we're, you know, working on a capital campaign to raise the money necessary. So if we are able to reopen, I'm hoping that you all will be able to come up to Milwaukee and visit with us. So today's presentation, we're going to talk about the history of residential segregation, how it developed, why it developed and look at some data uh, from current uh, census data. The most recent full count that was done was a 2010 census. So we're going to use data from that census to show uh, that segregation, which developed many, many years ago, still impacts us to this day. And so we'll be able to look at some demographics um, to show that there's still a great deal of segregation. So. There are a variety of different ways to measure segregation. The most common measure is the one that you hear about all the time. It's called the dissimilarity index. And what they do is they look at a metropolitan area and they look at the demographics of it and they say under normal circumstances, without segregated communities, people would be dispersed very evenly throughout that community. 
So if 13% of the population in that particular metropolitan area was African American, then they make up about 13% of each neighborhood. So what they do is they use a scale that goes from zero to 100. If the measure is zero, that means a completely integrated neighborhood or a statistical metropolitan area. Um, and if it's 100, that means it's completely segregated. So that measure gives us an idea of just how segregated a community is. People you know, have heard that Milwaukee is the most segregated city. It's actually not completely accurate. They are actually measuring the Milwaukee metropolitan area. So that includes Milwaukee, uh, the entire county of Milwaukee, and those 18 cities outside of Milwaukee that make up that, uh, th that metropolitan area, and the wow counties that wrap around Milwaukee, Waukesha, Ozaukee, and Washington County. So they're looking at the entire metropolitan area. And so I wanted to share with you uh, what it looks like. So one of the things that people aren't aware of is that segregation is not uh, just measured by the metropolitan areas and cities, it's also measured for each state as well. So they have segregation measures for African Americans versus whites, Latino Americans versus whites, Asian Americans versus whites, um, but the measure that you hear most often is the African American white segregation index. So if you look at the state of Wisconsin, this is kind of another way of seeing what segregation would look like. So for instance, if we had a community where 80% of the population uh, was white and 20% of the population was black, if we had an integrated neighborhood, the people would be randomly distributed, as you see. So there wouldn't be pockets of people. Those uh, non-whites would be evenly distributed around that in a very random fashion. But what you find is in a segregated community, it looks different. What you find are blocks of people that are very close together and they're not in other neighborhoods. So that's what a very segregated community looks like versus an integrated community. Under normal circumstances, people would pretty much live wherever they chose to live and there really wouldn't be you know, this level of segregation. Even though most of us have been led to believe that segregation is normal, that people want to live next to people who look like them, that pe people self-segregate, it's not true. It's never been true, and we'll look at how it developed. So if we look at the segregation index, the state of Wisconsin is considered the second most segregated state in the United States of America. And that's usually a surprise to people. Uh, and one of the things that I, that I like to, to, to just express to people, so in the state of Wisconsin, we have 72 counties, and only six of those counties is the African American population larger than 5%. Let me repeat that. Out of 72 counties in the state of Wisconsin, only six of those have an African American population greater than 5%. So that tells you that most of the places, most of the spaces in Wisconsin have very small numbers of black people. And I tell people that we don't really think about how that impacts us, but in a way it impacts us in a very strong way. Because what happens is when you don't have normal interactions with people, you make assumptions about who those people are based on information that you get from the news or television or movies or anecdotal stories you hear from people. It's not based on face-to-face -face contact and interaction. It's usually based on information that's not accurate. It's based on stereotypes, things of that nature. So when you have a community uh, like the state of Wisconsin where a majority of white people live in communities where there are little to no black people, the white people have a very difficult time understanding what black people are like. And likewise, the black people in Wisconsin uh, have a very difficult time understanding white people in the state of Wisconsin because most black people who live in those six counties uh, that are over 5%, uh, they don't really travel outside of those communities uh, to a large measure. So there are very few black people I know that go up north and do things in cabins up north. And I hear my white friends talk about going up north all the time. When I hear black people, they talk about going down south. You know, which is what I used to do when I was a kid. We would travel down to Chicago or down to Mississippi or down to Memphis. And so we don't have interactions. In fact, across the country, 91% of whites uh, have 
not a single person of color in their normal circle of people that they have interactions with on a normal basis. So the most segregated group, the most isolated group of people in the United States are white people. And to most whites, because it's been that way for such a very long period of time, it seems perfectly normal to them. And that impacts the way they see people from other communities. So if we look at that number 78, what does that 78 mean? Let me go back. So our segregation index for Wisconsin is 78. A uh, very quick and easy way of understanding what that 78 means, remember we're on a scale of 0 to 100. What 78 means is that in order for Wisconsin to become an integrated community, you'd have to have 78% of the black people in Wisconsin would have to move to new places. Or 78% of white people would have to move to different places. That would be the only way you would have a completely integrated state. So that tells you the level of segregation. I wanted you guys to see the list of the worst, uh, most segregated communities in the, in the country. So if we look at the 10 highest, Milwaukee, Detroit, New York, Chicago, Cleveland, one of the things that people notice about that list uh, very quickly is that most of those are in the north. They're not in the south for the most part. And most of those are in the Midwest. There is a very specific reason that northern Midwestern cities are the most segregated. Um, and then if we look at the list uh, on the other side, we see communities where that segregation index is much lower. Uh, and so as compared to those cities, people say, well, you know, people always talk about Milwaukee uh, being so segregated, but, you know, the numbers for Chicago and Detroit are very close. But there are a couple things that separate Milwaukee from those other places. Number one is that the numbers of blacks who moved to Milwaukee uh, did not coincide with the numbers of blacks who moved to Chicago and Detroit and Cleveland and places of that nature. In fact, they didn't move at the same time. So. Beginning in the 1930s, you had what was called the Great Migration. Blacks were leaving the South. You know, many people will tell you they were leaving the South to go to these northern cities for better jobs. No, they were not going for better jobs. That was one of the benefits uh, if they were able to get those jobs. In many cases, they weren't able to get those jobs because of discrimination. They were leaving because of violence. They were leaving because of the violence associated with Jim Crow segregation. Violence was a tool that was used by Jim Crow segregationists. Lynchings were occurring on a daily basis across the country. They were escaping to save their lives and the lives of their families. So when they began to move north, um, they didn't really move to Milwaukee in large numbers from the 1930s through the 1950s. They came to a place like Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland uh, instead. But beginning in the late 50s, early 60s, they began to move to Milwaukee and even Racine, Kenosha in larger numbers. Um, and so what you saw was another thing that separates Milwaukee versus those other big cities. Over the course of the last 40 some odd years, you've seen a change in the, the, the way cities look. So for instance, the segregation numbers for Chicago and Detroit and Cleveland and Milwaukee are very similar to what they were 40 years ago. The numbers have not changed very much. But if you look at those communities, they look quite a bit different. And Milwaukee doesn't look all that much different. The, big, the biggest separator that separates Milwaukee from those other big cities is that blacks don't move to the suburbs in Milwaukee. If you look at Milwaukee County, 94% of the black people who live in Milwaukee County live in the city of Milwaukee. If you look at the metropolitan area, which includes Milwaukee County, Washington County, Ozaukee County, and Waukesha County, 91% of black people live in the city of Milwaukee. If you take a look at other big cities like Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, you'll see that those numbers are not even close. So for instance, in Chicago, blacks have been moving out of the city in large numbers. They've been moving to the suburbs to the south and east of the city. In Detroit, they've been moving out to the suburbs. Uh, in Cleveland, they've been moving out to the suburbs. So for instance, in Chicago, between 30 and 40 percent of blacks in that metropolitan area actually live in the suburbs versus 6 percent uh, in Milwaukee. Uh, in Detroit, over 40 percent of blacks in the metropolitan area live in the suburbs. Cleveland, very similar numbers. So that's one of the things that separates Milwaukee is that our suburbs have not been very friendly or opening to black people and other cities have. 
even though with them moving to those communities, the segregation numbers are still very similar. So let's talk about the fact that segregation is not accidental. You've probably heard the same things I've heard during the course of my life that, you know, people live where they live because they want to live close to people who look like them and people, people self-segregate. It's completely untrue. In fact, when studies are done and they ask people where they want to live, in particular when they ask black people, what would your ideal community look like demographically? What would it look like? Would it be 90% black? Would it be 80% black? What would it look like? And typically the responses nationwide, uh, they ask blacks, they ask Asians, they ask Native Americans, they ask whites, they ask Latinos. And if you look at all of the responses from all of those groups, the, the group that talks about the most ethnically demographic community the one that's the most integrated by far are black people. They want to live in integrated communities more so than any other group according to these studies that are done. So it's a myth that black people want to live in all black communities. They don't, they never have, and they probably never will. They simply want to live in a community that they can call home, that they feel safe in, where there are jobs, and that's what everyone else wants. But there are other people who don't want certain groups in those neighborhoods with them. So when we look at the process of how we became such a segregated community, the federal government played a huge role in that. So I want to share with you guys some information about the mechanism. So this, Arnold Hirsch talks about there being a national policy which created segregation. Uh, those books that are on the screen are great resources for telling you how this process worked. Uh, in fact, probably the my favorite on the list is The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. It's a fairly recent book. And what Mr. Rothstein did, uh, which not many other people have done who study the history of segregation was other people talk about you know the fact that the federal government had a role in it he actually documents specifically what they did uh, and how they were primarily the driver of segregation and so we'll look at some information that he shares in his book uh, all of these books are really good uh, crabgrass frontiers an older book choosing segregation uh, is not all that old but it, it shows you how segregation happened uh, it had little to do with choices that people as residents and communities made uh, there were other mechanisms that played a role that helped people to create communities that were segregated. So let's look at some of those. So this is the Racine County demographics, looking at the communities here. So Burlington, we can see that a majority of the population, 97%, are whites and very small percentages of people of color in those communities. If we look at Caledonia, uh, very similar statistics there as well. And one thing to keep in mind, Latino is not a racial group. Most people think that Latino is a racial group. It's actually an ethnicity. So you can be white and Latino, you can be black and Latino, you can be Asian and Latino. So the numbers won't necessarily add up to 100 as a result of that. Um, if we look at Dover, we see that it's nearly 100% white. We look at Elmwood Park, we look at Mount Pleasant, North Bay, <coughs> Norway. The city of Racine is actually fairly um, diverse for the most part. In fact, it's in, Mol in, in Racine County, it's the only uh, community that has any level of diversity, as you've seen uh, from the, the previous slides. And there is a very specific reason for that. And remember I told you earlier that there are only six counties where uh, the African-American population is over um, 5%. Racine is one of those places. Um, and part of what helps to create that in Racine, in Milwaukee, in Kenosha, uh, in Dane County, those places, is that those were places that as blacks began to move to the state of Wisconsin in fairly significant numbers in the 60s, they came to those places because of the manufacturing base. There were factories that offered really, really good jobs, uh, high paying jobs, family supporting jobs, and they landed in those places. Uh, unfortunately, as we've all seen, I'm sure, over the course of the last 
really 30 some odd years, many of those manufacturing jobs have gone away. They've been replaced by you know, inferior jobs, jobs that don't pay nearly as well, that don't provide uh, the guarantee of a pension later. Uh, and so people have moved to those communities, like we're seeing Milwaukee, uh, in search of, you know, the American dream. And for a short period of time, they were able to live the American dream. They were able to get into some of those factories after a struggle at first because of discrimination and, and unions that discriminated, didn't allow blacks to get those jobs, a variety of different reasons. Once they were able to kind of get a foothold, though, they were able to have a level of success, but it didn't last very long because we as a nation have been going through a process of deindustrialization uh, beginning in large measure uh, in the late 70s when it really picked up steam. We lost a lot of very very, very high quality jobs and many communities are suffering as a result of that. So let's look at a couple more communities. Raymond, Rochester, Sturdivant. Now Sturdivant will, will, will make you think that there's a fairly significant number of blacks there. That's not really the way it works. One of the reasons it looked like there's a significant number of blacks in Sturdivant is because we all know there's a prison in Sturdivant, right? So if you are incarcerated in a prison, and you're probably black, you are counted as a resident of Sturdivant. You may be from Racine, you may be from Milwaukee, you may be from Kenosha, you may be from Madison, wherever, it doesn't matter where you're from. You're counted as a resident of that particular place. So that's why the number for Sturdivant makes you think that it's a fairly diverse community. It really isn't. Unless you go behind the walls of the prison, you won't see those black people. Union Grove. Yeah. Waterford. Wind Point, Yorkville, and, and, and I can just kind of tell uh, by the faces that these numbers are not surprising any of you. Uh, those of you who live uh, in this area, you, you're pretty well aware of the nature of who lives in what communities. And so, you know, one of the things that I found when I first did this um, presentation and I showed people the demographics. Uh, of Milwaukee County and uh, the, the ex-urban counties that surround it, people were astonished by the numbers. Uh, there's this perception in Milwaukee by a lot of people that because of the large numbers of blacks that they live everywhere in the region. And in fact, they simply don't. There are only three suburbs of the 18 suburbs of Milwaukee within Milwaukee County, only three suburbs where the black population is over 5%. Uh, so the rest of them are as white as they've always been. And we're going to talk about how they became that white here as well as in Milwaukee. So one of the things that, that's impacted by residential segregation is you get school segregation. So the Racine Unified School District, and I had a, a talk with uh, some people earlier about this, and this, this may be shifting at some point because of decisions that are being made. Uh, you find that the white percentage is just under 42%, the blacks are 26%, Latinos are 27%, and small numbers of uh, American Indians and Asians. And, and this is part and parcel of what happens when you have a residentially segregated community. You have, uh, if you go back historically, the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, which was designed to end segregated schools, it never really worked. Uh, there wasn't an enforcement mechanism that was strong enough to make it work. Um, school districts were given the option of how they were going to desegregate their schools, and the choices that they made to do it simply did not work. Uh, they tried busing, forced busing, primarily of uh, black children out into white schools. Uh, white families were not happy to have little black boys and little black girls sitting in the schools next to their children. And there were you know, violent uprisings around the country. Uh, um, white parents, you know, uh, very upset that black children, regardless of how small the numbers may have been, moving into those schools with their white sons and daughters. Um, and so there you had a backlash. You also had in the state of Virginia for four years, they closed almost every public school in the state of Virginia as a result of saying, we're not going to listen to the highest court in the land. We're going to do what we want to do. We're going to close all the public schools. And they said, well, if we close them, what's going to happen to the children? Well, what they did is they used public school money and they set up private academies for white children to go to. 
they didn't set up private academies for black children to go to. So for four consecutive years, most black children in Virginia did not have schools to go to, other than the freedom schools, which were set up by local churches and community organizations. And the white children sat in beautiful you know, campuses and got their education for those four years. That was really the beginning of uh, the growth of private schools in the nation. Prior to that, most students who went to private schools were from wealthy families. There was very few regular average people who could afford to send their children to these private academies. And those began to develop in the 1950s as a result of the backlash against Brown and continues to this day. For instance, in the city of Milwaukee, uh, whites, uh, non-Hispanic whites make up 37% of the population in the city of Milwaukee, but those children only make up about 13% of the students in Milwaukee's public schools. And so we continue to have that issue. Many places were under consent decree uh, for years, you know, forcing them to find a way to desegregate the schools. Busing didn't work. Um, they tried other mechanisms by creating magnet schools. Those didn't work. Uh, and eventually they said, well, you know, we're just going to go back to the old-fashioned way of doing things. They have neighborhood schools. In neighborhood schools, if you have a residentially segregated city, you're going to have residentially segregated cities will have bunches and bunches of segregated schools. So for instance, in Milwaukee, 72% of black students in Milwaukee public schools go to what are known as hyper-segregated schools. And hyper-segregated school is a school where 90% or more of the students are non-white. So seven out of every 10 black child in Milwaukee goes to a school that's primarily black. I want to tell you an interesting story about me personally. I moved to Milwaukee in 1973 from a little town in Mississippi, Charleston, Mississippi. Uh, if you're familiar with the state, it's in the northwestern part of the state, north central part of the state, about 70 miles south of Memphis, halfway between Grenada and Oxford. Uh, and when I started school, uh, I was able to go to school with white children in Charleston, Mississippi. They had integrated the schools the year that I started. Uh, I didn't really realize it. I didn't recognize it. It was just like, oh, it's just school. Uh, when I moved to Milwaukee, um, I began third grade in Milwaukee. So from third grade to eighth grade, every school that I attended was a school that was 100% black not a single white student at any of the schools I went to. The first time I went to school with white children in Milwaukee was in ninth grade when I caught the city bus all the way to the south side of Milwaukee to go to Milwaukee Trade and Technical High School. And that was, I didn't know it at the time, that was the first year that Milwaukee schools were forced to be uh, integrated. And so I always tell the story of here I, I am, this, this, this young child from Mississippi who is, has this reputation as being this horrific place racially. Uh, I was able to go to school with white kids in Mississippi, but come to Milwaukee and I couldn't. I didn't know it at the time. So, you know, I finally uh, refer to Wisconsin as Northern Mississippi. Or, you know, some people call it Mississippi. Uh, race relations here are very similar to what they are in the state of Mississippi. So. This is called a racial dot map of Racine. And so you have blue dots, green dots, red dots, and orange dots. And the dots represent one person. So it, it's a little hard to see, but you can see that uh, in the areas where there are mixed colors, where you have green, red, and orange, those are communities that are people of color. Uh, and in those communities, you find very few blue dots in those communities. So what you have in Racine are very racially diverse communities that have blacks, Latinos, and Asians living in them with barely any white people or no white people. And what you find is if you look around, you'll see where the blue dots are. They have very small numbers of other colors. And so Racine is very similar to Milwaukee in terms of its segregation level. They didn't, uh, or I wasn't able to find a, a segregation index for Racine. Uh, typically when you go to, to the, the websites at the University of Michigan where they keep track of these things, they typically just analyze the top 100 largest cities in the country. But if they were to do one of Racine, I think that they would find a very high level of segregation based on what we see on the map. Um, communities of people of color surrounded on the outskirts by mostly white people. So that's kind of what's going on in Racine. Those of you who live here uh, know this better than I do. So let's look at some mechanisms that create and support segregation. 
First of all, government industry support of segregation has played a huge role. Racial restrictive covenants, which some of you may have heard of, I'm gonna tell you more about those. A lack of low income housing. A lack of affordable housing is a huge problem, has been uh, for a significant amount of time. And it, oh, wait, hold on. That's what happens when you push the wrong button. And lastly is redlining. You've probably all heard of redlining. I, I, I thought I knew what redlining was until I started to do research for these presentations. I want to share with you some things I learned about redlining uh, that really surprised me. So racial restrictive covenants. These were legally binding agreements that were contracts imposed on property. Uh, and they were perfectly legal until 1968. They became illegal as a result of the Federal uh, Fair Housing Act in 1968. So what would happen is in communities, they would attach these contracts, these racial restrictive covenants to the deeds and they followed from owner to owner. They still apply. And these racial restrictive covenants were legally enforceable uh, by the court system until 1948. A case called Shelley versus Kramer. Uh, these were challenged and the, the U.S. Supreme Court said that you can no longer have local authorities force people to move out of these homes uh, because of these racial restrictive covenants. So prior to that, if there was a racial restrictive covenant on a piece of property and the owner of that property sold or rented to a person who was denied entrance based on what was in that covenant, the person who owned the property would lose the property and whoever those people were who moved in would be forced out by the local authorities. Uh, so what changed in 1948 was that the federal government said, well, you can't kick people out or you can't have the local authorities kick people out. So what they started to do is they said, well, you know what, we can't really kick people out, but we can still use these covenants. Uh, we're not gonna write them on paper anymore. What we'll do is we'll have this policy in place and we'll just pretend we don't. Uh, we'll have handshake agreements and the policies will still be the same. We will ask people in those communities to not rent or to sell to people of color. And there were other people who were impacted by them as well, which came as a surprise to me. So these were used primarily uh, to keep blacks out of communities, but other groups uh, fell prey to these as well. Uh, Asians, Mexicans, Jewish families, uh, Irish families, uh, Italian families, a variety of people, even the Milwaukee Polish families were prevented from living in certain places as a result of these racial restrictive covenants. And so what they did was they were used as a tool to create all white communities. And so prior to using racial restrictive covenants, the tool of choice that communities had to remain all white uh, was racial zoning law. So they would create a zoning law that said black people can't live in this part of town. Um, Native Americans can't live in this part of town. Jewish families can't live in this part of town. So those were challenged in 1917. Uh, they were ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court, and so they went to using these racial restrictive covenants beginning in 1917, moving forward. And for the most part, when they first started to use them, people didn't really know how powerful they were or how to use them. So our government stepped in in the 1930s and said, listen, we're going to show you how to use these more effectively. And we're actually going to demand that you use them whether you want to or not. And that was the beginning of a period that lasted for about 30 some odd years where the federal government helped to create and maintain racially segregated communities. They were the biggest player in this equation. So one of the things that, that I think is kind of surprising to people, uh, even if they've heard of these racial restrictive covenants, is how blatant they were. Uh, the language that they used was very clear. You didn't have to guess what they were talking about. So I wanted to show you examples of four. There's a group in Milwaukee at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee in 1979 that completed a report where they looked at um, properties throughout Milwaukee County and all of the 18 suburbs, and they looked for properties that had racial restrictive covenants attached to them. And so they were able to find that 16 of the 18 suburbs in Milwaukee use these very extensively. The only two that didn't were Oak Creek and River Hills. But in those, uh, 
16 communities that use them extensively, they found and they documented what they said. So I wanted to show you examples of four of those. This one was written in Cudahy, 1927. It was set to expire in 1952. Typically, the way these uh, racially restricted covenants work was that there was a start date and there was an expiration date, but that expiration date could be moved forward uh, by a vote of people in that uh, subdivision or community. They could say, okay, we're gonna extend it another five years, 10 years, whatever. Uh, so I wanted you to see specifically what they wrote uh, in each of these examples. So this is what they said. So they basically said that no properties within this particular subdivision could be used for business or residential purposes by colored people, which was a term they used to describe blacks. And the violation of the terms of this racial restricted covenant would ipso facto mean that you violated the terms and you would lose that property. In addition to that, you have another one in Shorewood, which is written in 1927, expired in 1946. And that one said that this subdivision shall not be occupied by any person of the Negro or Ethiopian descent unless they were employed by that white family as a domestic worker or as some person who did work for them around that house. So people who may have done their landscaping work could occupy that space doing that particular work. Other than that, you couldn't be there. Another phenomenon that went along with these racial restrictive covenants was this idea of sundown towns. Have you heard of sundown towns? Um, there is a famous historian who wrote a book called Sundown Towns, and what he found was that in communities around the country, most of them in the Midwest, large numbers of them in Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, uh, Michigan, um, Indiana, places in the northern Midwest, uh, had what they call sundown towns. Now, in some places, they actually had a sign that said, when the sun goes down, basically black people, you better be out of town. Uh, in some places, they had a siren that went off telling the black people, it's time to go. I know you've been working here, but time to go. The sun is going down. Don't be caught here. Uh, Wauwatosa, Wisconsin had um, the reputation of being a sundown town. In fact, uh, what they would do is the police in Wauwatosa were given very strict orders that uh, when the sun went down, they were, to, they were supposed to patrol the city, and if they found any black people that were still in Wauwatosa, they were to escort them back to the city of Milwaukee. So you had these sundown towns throughout the Midwest, uh, and that went right along with these policies. A couple more I want to show you. This one was in St. Francis, and this one said, and once again, they have the uh, exception uh, for domestic workers or servants. You can occupy that space. But other than that, sorry, you can't be there. And lastly, this one is one that surprises people because if you look at the expiration date, 2024. So they wrote this in 1937, and they were planning very far ahead. Um, obviously, it became illegal in 1968, became unenforceable in 1948, but they had plans on having this policy be in place for almost 100 years. The crazy thing about these racial restrictive covenants is that even though they became illegal in 1968, they became unenforceable by local authorities in 1948, once they are written, once they're attached to that property, they're there forever. They never go away. So any places where these racial restrictive covenants were attached to the property, it followed the owners. So for instance, a good friend of mine, uh, the home that she lives in um, was owned by a Jewish family years ago. And uh, one of the neighbors across the street when she moved into the home, um, they were you know, cleaning out the attic, going through and stuff that the previous family had found. And she actually found a copy of the Racial Restricted Covenant, uh, which said Jews can't live in this neighborhood. This was literally four blocks away from where I live. I actually did a title search on my house and found that there were no Racial Restricted Covenants attached to the home that my wife and I own. But these are very common and they're still there 
have they, they, they don't remove them. It's a very, very tedious process to get them removed. And most people don't see any reason to get rid of them. They're not enforceable. They're illegal, but they're still attached to millions of properties around the country. And this one said in very clear language that only persons who were citizens of the United States of the white race could occupy the property with the exception of domestic workers. And I wanted to show you those examples to show you how blatant people were in their discrimination. They were not trying to cover up or hide what they were doing. They were very explicit and they were very direct. And they had, you know, legal backing, backing because these were perfectly legal for an extended period of time. So those blacks who moved into those homes, in those few exceptions where whites violated those terms, they'd be moved out. They'd be forced out. And one of the interesting things about it is that when you go back, um, I heard a presentation by a young student at Wauwatosa uh, West High School, and she talked about the first black family that moved to Wauwatosa, Wisconsin back in 1955. Uh, it was um, a middle-aged black man who left the city of Milwaukee, moved out to Wauwatosa, and he was giving a very unwarm reception immediately. Uh, people began to vandalize his property, vandalize his vehicle immediately. Uh, people in the community who didn't have a problem with him there, uh, you know, came and, and offered him condolences for what some of the neighbors had done to his property, uh, tried to befriend him, and they actually had their properties damaged as a result of being friendly to this man. Um, and he dealt with this for an extended period of time. Eventually, people stopped. Uh, he grew kind of accustomed to it after a while. Um, the police didn't do anything to help. Uh, but he decided to stay and he, he remained in Wauwatosa uh, for the remainder of his life. So, redlining. Um, when I went into this journey of learning about segregation, I'd heard of redlining. And I knew that there were, you know, redlining maps that were drawn. I'd never realized how many. They were drawn in 239 cities around the country um, by the federal government and they were drawn in conjunction with the, the words of, of local people. So real estate agents, insurance agents, uh, local people who knew the, the lay of the land. And so the maps would be um, designated by a number or letter and a color. So the color green would be A, the color blue would be B, the color yellow would be C, and the color D would be red. So if it was red, that was the least desirable property, and it was impossible to get a mortgage if the area was redlined. What was the criteria for determining whether or not it would be blue, green, yellow, or red? There were a variety of factors. I thought uh, initially, based on what I you know, had heard my entire life, was that every place that was redlined was redlined because it was black people living there. That was one of the primary purposes of redlining, but they were redlined for other reasons as well. They were redlined uh, as a result of having ugly, filthy, uh, polluting factories close by, a lack of sanitation close by, um, you know, the roads and, and other uh, services not being in very good shape. Uh, but for the most part, they were designed to keep the neighborhoods that black people lived in as areas that you couldn't get a mortgage in. So. If there was a neighborhood and there was a single black family in there, it would be guaranteed to be redlined. That's all it took, was one black family. And so these began to show up and prevented blacks from purchasing homes. One of the things that we are not aware of is that the federal government is the reason that most of us are homeowners today. Back in the 1920s during the Great Depression, prior to that it was nearly impossible to have a mortgage on a home. Typically, you had to pay 50 to 75% down on a home. The terms of the mortgage were three to five years, and you had to pay you know, exorbitant amounts of money, and you didn't have an amortized loan, which meant you didn't pay part principal and part interest. You simply paid interest. And so what would happen, you'd have to constantly, constantly you know, refinance, and it would take you forever to pay for that home. Uh, the federal government stepped in, uh, and created a program which lowered the interest rates to anywhere from 2 to 0%, lowered the down payment to next to nothing, uh, 
and lengthened the term alone to 20 to 30 years and that began the growth of Americans becoming homeowners. Prior to that, it was very rare. Uh, and so as a result of that, you began to see the growth of the middle class in the United States and you began to see an increase in the wealth. Wealth as it's measured today, primarily the wealth that we have isn't in our bank account, our stock portfolios, 401ks, things of that nature. It's in the property that we own. Most of the wealth that's in the possession of Americans is in the property that they own. So they began to offer people these mortgages and guarantee these mortgages. So they would guarantee typically up to 80% of the loan. And as a result of that, people began to buy houses around the country in very large numbers. But they discriminated. They specifically instructed financial institutions to not lend in neighborhoods that had black people in it. Even if it was just one family. They said, no, nope. redline it, don't give them a mortgage. So what did black people do who wanted to buy a house? Well, they couldn't get a mortgage specifically not a mortgage that was backed by the federal government. So what they would do is they would purchase homes on contract is what they called it. So this is the way it worked. You would go and you would purchase the home and you would have a contract and you would pay X number of dollars per month. And after a number of years, you would have the house paid off, right? It wasn't a mortgage. You didn't build any equity in it. You just simply paid month after month after month. But the way these contracts are drawn up, if you were late, or if you missed the payment, you start over from scratch. You could have been paying consecutively, never missing payment, 15 straight years. You miss one payment, you're starting all over again. And that was the way most black people were able to purchase homes on contracts. So they didn't build equity, they didn't build family wealth. They had an underwriting manual, the Federal Housing Administration, and it basically told people who were building these new subdivisions that if you want us to look favorably on these new subdivisions and the homes that are being built in them, you better use racial restrictive covenants. If you want us to guarantee the mortgages in that community. If you don't use them, we will not finance any of the homes in that community. And that was really the only way that you could get financing at that time was through the Federal Housing Authority. So they created a mechanism that basically demanded discrimination. They loaned up to 80% of the loans from 1930 to 1950 of all of the homes around the country, and there were millions that they guaranteed these loans for. 98% of those homes were homes owned by white people. Think about that. 98% were homes owned by white people. So what did it do? It created a uh, middle class, it created wealth in white communities around the country. And one of the things that I always try to emphasize to people is that unless you understand how we got to where we are, you don't really understand where we are today. And we talk about the, 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 the wealth gap. We talk about um, all of these different issues in terms of disparities between people of color and whites, in particular uh, Native Americans and blacks. And many of these things are directly related to this because blacks were not given the same opportunities to build wealth. Uh, they were discriminated against in jobs, so they didn't have the same opportunities to get to where white people got. And we, we hear people say, well, you know, my family came over from Italy, or my family came over from this, that, and the other place in Europe, and, and they did it. Well, why can't black people do what they did? You know, they have this strong Protestant work ethic, and that's why they have what they have. That's nonsense. They have what they have because the federal government gave them what they have. It was nothing more than governmental welfare. We don't like to call it that, but that's exactly what it was. And this is why we have a middle class in America as a result of the federal government putting billions of dollars into financing these loans. So blacks were typically forced to pay more for properties that they purchased. This is kind of how it worked. You've probably heard that you know when blacks move into the neighborhood, the property values decrease immediately. Nonsense. The exact opposite happened. Uh, the real estate industry used this, this method that they call block busting. And this is what they would do. You would have people who would buy property from whites after scaring the crap out of them, telling them the black people are coming. They're only two blocks up the street. You better sell while you can. And those white people would be forced to sell their properties at a deflated cost, way below what it was worth. 
And then they would sell those properties to black people on contract, and they would charge them three, four times more than what the white family sold it for. So the white family would sell the house for uh, a deflated value. The black family would come in and buy it for an inflated value. And so what happened to the property values? They increased, not decreased, they increased significantly around the country. And this was a tool that was used to basically scare white people into moving out of communities as they were becoming integrated. So they basically looked at the usage of racial restrictive covenants and they said, listen, you know, some of you, you guys are using them, but you're not using them as well as you should. You're not being very efficient. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you how to use them better. And in their underwriting manuals, they began to actually utilize examples. So they wrote an example of the ideal racial restrictive covenant. And they said, here, if you don't know how to write one, here you go. And they demanded that people use them. Uh, and this idea of keeping inharmonious racial groups out of those communities and out of those schools is the reason that we have the, the level of segregation that we have today. Not because people have self-segregated. The only people who've ever had the ability to self-segregate are white people. No one else has had the backing of the federal government and the real estate industry to segregate their communities. White people have. And believe me, they took advantage of the opportunity. So not only did they do this, but they bragged about it. So in 1939, they bragged that, you know, there were people who were, you know, reticent to utilize these restrictive covenants and segregate their neighborhoods. Uh, but once we talked to them, and they kind of got it, they really, they, they began to do it. And we, we take great pride in the fact that we were able to impact them in this way by convincing them to create these segregated neighborhoods. So not only did the federal government do it, they bragged about it as if it was a good thing. And then in 1948, when this was challenged in a case called Shelley versus Kramer, and the U.S. Supreme Court said that this is unconstitutional. You can't have these communities, you know, kick people out and have the police go and the sheriff's department go and evict people. Then they began to change their underwriting manuals and take that wording out, which demanded racial restrictive covenants. And to take it a step further, then they said, we never did this in the first place. We didn't have anything to do with it. We never told anybody to use racial restrictive covenants. And people were like, um, here's your 1938 underwriting manual. It's right here. This is an example. You have a model racial restrictive covenant right in this book, which you've been using. And now you want to lie and say you never did it? And so, of course, they just kind of like, oh, okay, you caught us. But they never really, moving forward, admitted that they were responsible. National Association of Real Estate uh, Board did the same thing. They demanded in their code of ethics that these real estate agents uh, not force members of any race or nationality or individuals uh, into communities because it would be detrimental to property values, even though they knew clearly it would not be detrimental to property values initially. It would later, because what happens is when those black families moved into those neighborhoods, the reason the property values went down wasn't because the black people moved there. The reason the property values went down was once the black families moved there and there was such a restricted area that they could move into, there were so many who were trying to get out of the old housing stock into newer communities that they literally had to live two and three families per home. And obviously, you're not going to be able to take care of that property in the same way if you have that large number of people in it. Uh, and because of uh, discrimination in jobs, uh, many of these people weren't able to take care of the properties the way that they could, uh, and the properties would sometimes deteriorate. So National uh, Association of Real Estate Boards helped to normalize segregation. These are some terms from um, Chicago, the city of Chicago. Uh, people talked about how do you create this mechanism. And so you use discriminatory mortgage terms. So there were lending limits for blacks. They've had to pay higher down payments and the mortgages are shorter. So just to show you how explicit these things were, um, this, this real estate um, organization said this. 
Negroes are usually allowed $1,000 and the white man's $1,500. Only 35% of the value of the property is loaned to the Negro. 50% is granted to whites. Maximum time for the loan was five years for whites and three years for Negroes. Now this was in 1921, prior to the federal government stepping in and, and creating a system which extended the terms of those loans. So people are already finding very um, cozy ways of discriminating against blacks and preventing them from gaining the wealth that white families had. Uh, and this is very widespread around the country. One of the most important um, roles that was played was by these valuators. So insurance companies, in order to issue insurance, they had to have this report of evaluator. So this person would go out to the property and evaluate it and they would write a report uh, for the insurance companies to use to determine whether or not they were going to give insurance. And so this uh, evaluator was asked to do these things in his report. Are inharmonious racial or social groups present in the neighborhood? If not, is there any danger of infiltration of these groups and when? So if this evaluator went in and said that yes, there are these inharmonious social groups, then that area would be redlined. So you had the federal government, you had the real estate board, and you have the national insurance industry all complicit in creating barriers to blacks moving into neighborhoods, creating barriers that made neighborhoods as white as possible. It didn't happen accidentally, and all of these players were involved. And, and, and one of the things to keep in mind is that there weren't white people who were jumping up and saying, this is unfair, we shouldn't do this. They weren't saying that. They were perfectly okay with it. For the most part, there were very few whites who argued against it. Uh, typically, the only whites who argued against it were whites who were impacted. So Jewish families were impacted by this. And they said, hey, this isn't fair. Because in many cases, these uh, racial restricted covenants, these red line maps, uh, were based on Jewish families living in communities. I read about a case in Boston uh, where Irish families had their neighborhoods red lined. Uh, in Milwaukee, Polish families, Mexican families were red lined as well. So typically, unless they were impacted, whites would not complain. So what was the impact? Prior to 1930, segregation was decreasing around the country. And from 1910 to 1930, you saw a large amount of integration occurring around the country. And beginning in 1930, when the federal government stepped in and began to force people and push people to use racial restrictive covenants, uh, and redlining maps, that's when segregation began to increase dramatically around the country in cities from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, and so the segregation that we see today was created artificially and on purpose. And we still see the remnants of it because once you create a mechanism where you have all white communities, it's very difficult to go back and force those communities to become integrated communities. And typically what happens, uh, if you look at Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland cities where you've had blacks move into the suburbs, one of the things that you find is that once they move into those neighborhoods, the whites that are there begin to move out. Uh, in Milwaukee, uh, there's, there's this, this, this term they call a tipping point. And that's the point where a certain percentage of people of color move in and there's a huge exodus of white people from the community. So probably the most racially diverse suburb of Milwaukee is Brown Deer, Milwaukee. Uh, my in-laws live in Brown Deer, Milwaukee. And they've been there you know, for an extended period of time. Uh, when my wife and I uh, first met back in 2000, uh, you know, we would visit her, her parents there, and we've been visiting regularly uh, for a number of years. We've been married now for 17 years. Uh, and we've noticed a change in the neighborhood. So I keep telling people that, um, you know, the neighborhood has shifted. You're beginning to see a lot more black families in Brown Deer. You're beginning to see more, a lot more Asian families, in particular Hmong families, are moving to Brown Deer. And literally, every time we go over there, we see a house owned by someone white which has a sign in the yard that they're selling the home. So they've reached the tipping point and lots of whites have packed up and moved. It's a very nice neighborhood. I mean, it's, it's beautiful, well-kept lawns, uh, very safe. The schools there are very good. 
Uh, there's no reason to move out of the neighborhood. It's no different now than it was 30 years ago, with the exception that it's not all white anymore. And so uh, for people to pack up and leave and say that the property values have decreased, they haven't. They've increased, in fact. Uh, so the justification that people use uh, is typically a lie. The white people have left because they don't want black or Asian neighbors. That's why they're leaving. Regardless of what they may say, uh, it's very easy to see. And, and I, I tell people all the time that the neighborhood we live in in Milwaukee uh, is a fairly diverse neighborhood called Sherman Park. You may have heard uh, our neighborhood on the news last year and on the international news. You know, there were the city was on fire. Sherman Park is burning. There were literally eight fires set. One gas station. And then eight blocks away, there were five businesses set on fire. And then 22 blocks away, there was another business that was set on fire. The whole city of Milwaukee wasn't on fire. Um, but people think that Sherman Park is this horrible place to live. And I tell people all the time, listen, my wife and I have been in Sherman Park since 2003. We love Sherman Park. We love our neighbors. I would not trade my neighbors for those rude neighbors that my in-laws have at Brown Deer under any circumstances. Uh, I'm a person, and anyone who knows me, you probably can see this. I like to talk. It wasn't always this way. I used to be very quiet. I think I was holding it in when I was a child. Uh, but I, I talk to all of my neighbors. I know everybody on the block. And because when I grew up, that was the way it was. We knew everybody on the block. We knew all of the families, everybody was, it was, a, it was a real community. So I want my block to be that way. And so I talk to everybody in the neighborhood. I know everybody, everybody knows me. My wife, you know, is very shy. She doesn't talk to people, but everybody in the neighborhood knows me. And I love it because it's a very neighborly community. Uh, and Brown Deer, um, my in-laws, their neighbor to the right is a very friendly guy. Um, the neighbors across the street are very rude. Very rarely ever speak. Uh, the neighbors to the left of them, uh, they speak when they want to, but most of the time they don't speak. Uh, and the people a couple of miles away never speak. Uh, and to me, that's not a neighborhood I would ever want to live in. So uh, that's just the way things are in Brown Deer. So if we look at a six year period of time at the role that the FHA played in terms of you know, financing mortgages across the country, Three and a half million of these mortgages that they financed were to build suburban housing. They gave subsidies for rent in the suburbs and in terms of housing for non-white people over this period of time, less than 30,000 homes were guaranteed by the Federal Housing Authority. And 15% of those were designated for blacks only or Mexicans only, but whites could move into some of those. So you see the impact you see the lack of support for non-whites versus whites in particular in the suburbs. And you saw this huge growth in the suburbs right after uh, World War II in particular. And so what did that do? It created very wealthy suburbs. It created communities where most of the people were homeowners. And it left cities where blacks were stuck, where Mexicans were stuck without the same resources. And I tell people all the time, you have to understand that the suburbs weren't just created for free. It cost a lot of money to build the suburbs. It cost money to build freeways to get people to the suburbs. It cost money to build the infrastructure of the suburbs. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the road systems there, uh, the sewage systems, water treatment facilities, electrical grid, all those things cost lots of money. Where did the money come from? It came from the federal government for the most part. And what the federal government did was that they said, well, we're going to give this money to the state of Wisconsin and you distribute it however you choose. So instead of the state of Wisconsin distributing this money to the cities, like we're seeing Milwaukee, Kenosha, like they had done forever, they said, we're gonna use some of this money to build suburbs. And so they took money out of these dying cities whose infrastructure was falling apart and put it into building brand spanking new, pretty, lovely suburbs for white people to live in. And the cities deteriorated. You saw the deterioration here in Racine. You saw it in Milwaukee. You saw it in Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, all these other places. So I always want people to understand that se segregation is not just about where people live. 
I, I look at it as these tentacles that extend it into other spaces. I always say that segregation is not just about where you live, it's about the spaces you occupy. So you create spaces that are very unfriendly to people of color. We have communities in Milwaukee that are very unfriendly to people of color. Uh, years ago, I worked as an electrician at a company called WH Brady, and we had several plants around the Milwaukee area, including one in Cedarburg, which is kind of northwest of Milwaukee, and we had blacks who worked at that facility. Now, they would have to drive on these little county roads, because suburb, you know, Cedarburg was in the middle of nowhere, basically. Uh, very dark little country roads to get there, no major, you know, freeways or anything. And so these black workers, uh, because the plant was open 24 hours a day, they would go there uh, to work the night shift. There was a 12-hour shift, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And several other people that I work with at the plant in Milwaukee had previously worked at the plant in Cedarburg. And they would tell me of a period of time where they would drive out to Cedarburg to go to work each night and they would be pulled over by police each night. They would only pull over the black people. They wouldn't pull over anybody else. And each time they pulled you over, they asked you, what are you doing out here? Well, I work for Brady. I'm on my way to work. Okay. Next night, pull you over again. What are you doing out here? Just like I told you last night, officer, I'm on my way to work. I have on my uniform. I work for Brady. And so it became um, so commonplace that they complained to the uh, HR department about it. So the HR department sent a uh, notice to the city of police about them harassing their black workers. And their response was this. Okay, this is what we want you to do, Brady. Give them a pass showing that they belong out here and we won't pull them over anymore. So give them a pass and a little sticker to put in their window and we'll know they're okay. We'll know that they belong because they work out here. Other than that, we're going to pull them over. Well, they got back to the human resource director and he threatened to sue the Cedarburg Police Department and they left people alone after that. But many of the black workers said, man, I'm not coming out here. And they transferred to the facilities in the city of Milwaukee. Suburban zoning restrictions keep poor people out of suburbs. This is another tool that was used. So when the 1968 Fair Housing Law was passed nationally, um, you know, ending redlining, uh, ending um, race restrictive covenants, ending all of these measures that were put in place to segregate communities, um, we thought that you know, there was a, a new time. Things would change, but it really didn't. And part of the reason it changed is because these communities began to use zoning laws that said, okay, we can't really discriminate in the way we want to, so what we'll do is we'll discriminate in a new way. What we'll do is we'll create zoning laws that demand that properties out here be a certain size. So you can't build little bitty homes. You have to build these gigantic monstrosities of a home, which were obviously more expensive. And then you have um, density laws, which means that you have to have a certain level of density. You can't have very dense neighborhoods. The houses have to be spread out more so. And so what that did was created um, unaffordable homes. So think about it like this. In 1968, when it became illegal to discriminate, uh, blacks were then given the opportunity to move to these communities in the suburbs, right? But eventually what happens as a result of these communities being very segregated over the course of time, the property values increased tremendously. So by the time blacks could finally move there, and they had been trying since the 50s to move to these suburbs, by the time 20 years later when they could actually move there legally, they were too expensive to move there. And so blacks were stuck in central cities around the country. It happened in Milwaukee. It's still one of the main reasons Milwaukee's suburbs have so few black people because why would you go and buy a house in Menominee Falls that's smaller than a house you could buy in Milwaukee and pay three or four times as much money? It wouldn't make sense. It would be idiotic, but I know people, I can't say they're idiots, but they do it on a regular basis. I would never do it. Uh, but this is kind of what happened around the country when blacks could afford to move to these suburbs. They weren't allowed to because of discrimination. And when they finally had the opportunity legally to do so, they couldn't afford to live there anymore. The GI Bill played a huge role in this. So we know that after World War II, the federal government created the greatest welfare program in history. Literally $95 billion 
was expended by the federal government on the GI Bill. And what it did was it gave veterans returning from World War II and eventually Korean War and all other wars that have been fought since then the opportunity to get a VA guaranteed loan uh, to purchase a home or to open a business. It also gave you money to go to college or technical school. What this did was it created a mechanism that allowed these returning white veterans to take advantage of these opportunities, but it discriminated against black veterans. So what happens is when black veterans came back expecting the same ability to get loans to buy businesses and buy homes what they found out was that uh, state of Mississippi is not gonna give you a loan buddy state of Arkansas is not gonna give you a loan buddy state of Georgia is not gonna give you a loan buddy your neighborhood is red line so you can't get a loan anyway and as far as going to school 1947 you're black you're not gonna go to the University of Mississippi you're not going to go to Ole Miss, you're not going to go to LSU, you're not going to go to the University of Georgia, University of Alabama, University of Florida, because guess what? They are historically white colleges and universities. We always hear people talk about historically black colleges and universities. We never hear anybody say historically white colleges and universities, and that's exactly what these places were. So blacks who wanted to go to these technical schools and colleges to get higher education and move into middle class professions, and do well for themselves. They were they were limited in their ability to get the education that they deserve because they fought just as well as anyone else did in these battles in World War II. But they couldn't get the home loans, they couldn't get the business loans, they couldn't get money to go to school because there were very few schools for them to go to. And so that set black people back tremendously and it put white people for the most part on track to build the middle class that we see today. Most white families that own property today, they gained that property as a result of the GI Bill after World War II. Ninety-five billion dollars was expended by the federal government, the greatest welfare program in the nation's history. So in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act, um, Mitt Romney's dad, George Romney, was in charge of housing and urban development. He said, okay, we have a, a strong law in place. We're going to enforce this law. Any communities that are still discriminating, we're going to say, we're going to cut off any federal funding for any of your projects, any water projects, electrical projects, any of these projects that you get federal funding for, we're going to cut you off if we find that you're still discriminating. So this was a hammer in his hand. And he created this program called Open Communities. Well. When he sent letters to these communities saying, I'm going to cut off that money you were expecting to get for that highway project or that road project or that sewage project or whatever it may be, those people complained to the Nixon administration and President Nixon said, okay, I don't like this. Kill it. And that's exactly what he did. He said, I'm opposed to this. Knock it in the head right now. And so the first real attempt to enforce the 1968 open housing, fair housing law, national law, ended up being a complete failure because the Nixon administration killed it. Now, we, next year, will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And people will be running around and having big programs at libraries and places all over. Just like in Milwaukee right now, we're having celebrations of the 50th anniversary. You guys may have seen some of the exhibits from the Fair Housing Marches in Milwaukee. Uh, 200 days of marching by blacks and some of their white compatriots for 200 consecutive days to open housing uh, in the city of Milwaukee. And I tell people, be careful what you celebrate because we're celebrating that moment in time without looking at what happened afterwards. We celebrate the Brown versus Board of Education decision without looking at what happened after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, that it didn't really work. We celebrate the March on Washington in August of 1963 without recognizing that three weeks later, a bomb, dynamite, was put in a church in Birmingham, Alabama and killed four little girls and injured dozens of other people just three weeks after the March on Washington, but we still celebrate it every year like it was this momentous occasion without looking at what happened afterwards. We will be celebrating the open housing ordinance, federal level, next year. There'll be big celebrations all over the country. People will be patting themselves and people on the back for the wonderful work that they did creating this without recognizing it, it, it was never really enforced. This is what President Nixon said in his opposition. He said, and, and this is very clear, um, his opposition was based on race. 
I'm convinced that while legal segregation is totally wrong, that forced integration of housing or education is just as wrong. I realize that this position will lead us to a situation in which blacks will continue to live for the most part in black neighborhoods and where there will be predominantly black schools and predominantly white schools. Now, keep in mind that Congress had just passed, <laughs> shortly before he made this statement, four years before he made this statement, they had passed this open housing law on the federal level, which said that everything that the president was saying in this was illegal. So it was actually illegal to do what he did, but he did it anyway. And guess what? That became the law of the land. Because you can have these open housing ordinances and laws on the books, but I always tell people a law is not worth the papers written on if it's not enforced. And it was never enforced. There's never been heavy enforcement of the 1968 open housing law. And as a result of that, we celebrate things without realizing we look like idiots celebrating it because it never really took effect. Current impediments to fair housing. Lack of required enforcement mechanisms for complaints of discrimination. In most cities, when you want to complain about housing discrimination, the, the, the mechanism in place in that city is, is not designed to handle the level of complaints. Uh, they don't have enough enforcement agents. They don't have enough investigative agents. So people generally will hire a private attorney to file a discrimination complaint. Affordable housing supply is horrible. I just read just the other day in Milwaukee, and there's been over the last seven years in Milwaukee, I'm sure many of you have seen the, the, the new arena that they're building for the Bucks uh, with $480 million of taxpayers' money, including my own going into it. It's going to be a beautiful facility. Other financial institutions have been sued multiple times for discriminating against blacks. So a black person who has the same credit score, the same kind of uh, income history as a white person, they don't get the same loan as a white person. People don't like to admit it. People like to say, well, that's not true. It's absolutely true. Several insurance companies have been sued for charging higher rates for blacks, even though there was no reason to. When we look back at the housing crisis, the bubble bursting in 2008, uh, we hear people say, well, you know, uh, the, the housing crisis happened because people got these loans and they couldn't afford them. And you know, they got loans that they know they shouldn't have gotten in the first place. Nonsense. That's a complete lie. Let me tell you what happened. In 1980, President Reagan became president. And shortly thereafter, he created a mechanism which allowed banks who had, they were in the business of keeping your money safe, right? He allowed banks to get into the business of doing something different. They allowed banks to get into the investment business. So most major banks created, outside of the regular bank, they created investment engines as well. So these investment engines would begin to take advantage of the fact that people were buying mortgages. And what they would do is they would package mortgages together and those would be placed in a form that people could actually purchase them and make money off of them. So if the property values increase, then they would make money. Uh, people could bet against the property values increase and they could actually bet that a majority of people in this package who have mortgages are going to default on their mortgages. And if people defaulted, people made money. So what happens is, as the housing market went crazy in the early 2000s, uh, housing prices were inflated irrationally. There was no reason to see the increase that we saw. And we began to see uh, something that was created by Reagan in 1981, a new type of mortgage. Prior to 1981, every mortgage was pretty much the same. It was fixed rate, and it was typically either 15 or 30 years, right? There was no fancy smancy mortgages. Everybody, you, you didn't have to be a, a lawyer uh, to read a mortgage, right? It may have been 35 pages, but you could still understand it. Well, in 1981, they began to create these fancy smancy mortgages where there would be a balloon payment or there would be a variable interest rate. They would entice you only 2% interest, variable. And so, man, man 2%. How am I going to take advantage of that? And what happens is people went out and they got these variable rate loans for their mortgages. 
not recognizing that when those terms changed, that interest rate could go to whatever. You, you never knew. There was no cap on how high they could go. So what happens is you had what people call the subprime crisis, right? Prior to the housing bubble bursting in 2008, I had never heard the term subprime loans before. And with subprime loans, there's two pockets of loans. Prime loans, subprime loans. Supposedly, subprime loans went to people with poor credit history or people who didn't necessarily have the, a, a specific amount of money to put down on a home or didn't have the ability to buy a specific um, size home, a specific price home. So what we were told after the housing bubble burst was the reason the housing bubble burst was because all of these people went out and got these subprime loans and they defaulted on their loans and it's their fault that the housing bubble burst. Nonsense. It's a lie. In fact, 85% of the subprime loans that were issued were not first mortgages. They were second mortgages. These were people that had paid off their mortgages. People that bought houses in the 60s and 70s and 80s paid them off. And they went and they were enticed into getting this low interest home equity loan. So people went and got these second mortgages and guess what happened? They lost their homes as a result of a second mortgage. Many of these people who got so-called subprime loans, and subprime loans typically required you to pay a much higher interest rate than a prime loan, was supposed to be based on credit history and all those other things, but what they found when they did studies, uh, specifically blacks, that over 40% of black people who got subprime, subprime loans nationwide, over 40%, were actually eligible for prime loans. They were discriminated against because they didn't know the difference. Nobody said, oh, here's a contract that says on the top subprime loan for your mortgage, and then the other one said prime loan. It didn't say that. You didn't know the difference. You just know, um, you know I'm getting this second mortgage, I'm getting this first mortgage, whatever. It's a mortgage. You thought they were all the same. So what ends up happening is the reason that people lost their homes is because the prices of homes were going through the roof, and people were buying homes for rental properties and flipping them and making you know, ridiculous amounts of money, but guess what? At some point, somebody in 2008 woke up and said, wait a minute, why is this house worth $200,000 and two years ago it was worth $25,000? And people said, I'm not gonna pay you $200,000 for this raggedy little house. I'll pay you $30,000 and that's when the bubble burst. When people woke up and recognized that they were being idiots by paying these ridiculous amounts of money for homes that weren't worth that much, that's why the housing bubble burst. Don't believe this lie about all these subprime loans and these people got loans they couldn't afford. Nonsense. It was a trick. People were tricked into buying homes, into getting very bad mortgages, and those mortgages are still being used to this day. They tricked people who didn't have the financial wherewithal to understand what they were signing. Suburban policies, the zoning laws that I talked about, mortgage lending discrimination, which happened across the country, housing and employment discrimination ordinances, which are either very, you know, some are not being enforced at all. And the ones that are being enforced are not being enforced in a very heavy-handed way. So these are some of the modern things that are impediments to fair housing. So you've probably heard at some point, if you live in Milwaukee, I know you've heard this because uh, right after Sherman Park, one of our aldermen went on uh, television and said these words, Milwaukee is the worst place in America to live if you're a black person. He got a lot of criticism, but he was right. If you look at all of these demographic factors related to well-being in Milwaukee uh, and the state of Wisconsin, Milwaukee is the worst place to live if you're a black person. And Wisconsin is the worst state to live in if you're a black person. So let me show you some of that evidence of why Wisconsin is such a horrible place. This is a man, his name is Dave. It's a guy I met. Um, maybe back in March. So I'm driving down the street, I see this guy with this cart with all of this stuff on it. I pull over, I say, you mind if I talk to you for a minute? They say, oh yeah, sure. So, you know, I was dressed similar, I had a little tie on. Uh, and he says, sure, sir. I'm like, man, don't call me sir, it makes me feel old. As if that's a bad thing. Um, 
And so I said, uh, you know, what's going on with this cart? He says, you know, I'm, I'm going over to the recycle place around the corner. Uh, this is my means of, of, you know, taking care of myself. My, my, my twin brother and I uh, both have lost our jobs within the last couple months. Uh, you know, we get a small amount of money from the state, you know, uh, for food. Uh, but both of us lost our jobs. And this is the only way we can afford to pay for our, you know, the place we live in. And I thought to myself, this man is a perfect example of the mythology of black people not wanting to work. This man gets up every morning at 4.30, and he literally works till the sun goes down, collecting recyclables to pay his bill. He's not working because he doesn't want to work. He's not working because he was laid off from his job. Him and his brother, and his brother has um, mental health issues as well. They're poor not because they want to be poor. They're poor because of circumstance. And I, I, I just spoke on this issue uh, a couple of days ago uh, at Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance. I told them, I said, listen, one of the mythologies that we have about the condition of black people in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin, and it's, it's a mythology, is that black people are in a condition they're in because of decisions that they've made. Well, listen, let me tell you something. These factories are closing racing. Black people didn't own any of them. They didn't pack up and move to Alabama or to Arizona or to Mexico or to Japan or to Indonesia or wherever. Black people never owned any of those factories. They didn't make any of these people lose their jobs. They were the people who worked in the factories. They lost their jobs. Not because of the decision they made, because of the decision some person with a lot of money made. Same thing in Milwaukee. Milwaukee lost 81% of its manufacturing jobs from 1963 to 2001. 81%. And those are the good jobs in Milwaukee. Didn't require any college education at all. You could go there and work 35, 40 years, get a nice pension, buy a nice house, buy nice cars, go on nice trips, send all your children to college. Those are the good jobs. Those jobs disappeared. Not because black people say, well, I don't want to work at Alice Chalmers anymore. It's because Alice Chalmers closed. A.O. Smith, which was the biggest employer on the north side of Milwaukee where the majority of blacks live, at one time employed 7,000 people. They went out of business. Now, we have this new development where A.O. Smith is, and it's a company um, that is going to be working on trains. So they were initially going to build trains here, but now they're just going to maintain trains. It's an Italian company. Uh, and it was big news back in the spring. Telgo is back in Milwaukee. They're going to be hiring people in Milwaukee. We should be celebrating it. And I had a conversation with the mayor and several of our elected officials at an event I was at. And I said, I said, why are you guys hyping up Telgo so much? They said, because it's a great opportunity. We're putting people back to work. I said, listen, A.O. Smith employed 7,000 people at one time. Telgo, which got subsidies from the state of Wisconsin to build their plant there, is going to employ a total of 37 people. I'm sorry, 37 people is not very many. It's more than 37 people that live within 500 feet of my house. So why are we celebrating this like it's the next coming of A.O. Smith? It's not going to make that big of a difference. Sure, it's great that those 37 people will get a job, but there's a sign in front of where the old A.O. Smith factory was. Uh, they used to make uh, frames for cars and trucks. They were the biggest in the world. And they employed 7,000 people. They had a sign that I saw just yesterday. They were finally taking the sign down. It's been there since 2010. And the sign said, this new development, you know, and they have all of these sponsors, the city of Milwaukee, Milwaukee County, all of these, you know, like 15 different sponsors, sponsoring this, this project to redevelop the old land A.O. Smith was on, right? and it promised to build all these buildings. So they have an like artist's rendering of all of these new buildings that they were gonna build, right? Beautiful sign. They've only built one of those buildings. But on the sign, it promised, and you saw like probably 15, 20 different new buildings built there, right? All of these new factories. And it said coming in 2013. They just took the sign down. Yesterday, I was driving past. They just took the sign down. I'm like, you lied. You're doing all this development in downtown Milwaukee, the east side of Milwaukee, just north of downtown, spending billions of dollars. But you're not spending a nickel in the central part of the city 
which is where most of the job losses were. So we continue to have people not doing what they should do, and this man is one of the recipients of this poor policy. So let's look at some of these statistics. Wisconsin, and I misspelled Wisconsin. I don't know how that happened. I, I think I was really tired that night when I typed this slide. But anyway, has the second highest black white residential segregation, as I told you earlier. We have the highest incarceration rate for black males. Remember I told you in Sturdivant, many of those people in Sturdivant who are black are actually residents of prison there. Uh, the incarceration rate here is two times the national average. In addition to that, we have the second worst black poverty rate, nearly 40% five times greater than the white rate. Wisconsin has the widest white-black gap in test scores in every single subject. Math, reading, science, social studies, every subject. The gap is the largest in Wisconsin. In addition to that, this is to me the most amazing statistic about the state of Wisconsin. Now around the country, for years due to the fact that people were getting better medical care, um, and having more access to medical care, the gap between the life expectancy of whites and blacks has been getting smaller. So blacks are living almost as long as whites. It's, it's, the gap is, is shrinking significantly since back in the 60s. But for some reason, the gap is growing in Wisconsin. Out of all of the 50 states, only one state has the gap getting bigger instead of smaller. That's Wisconsin. The primary reason for that prior to Obamacare was a lack of access to medical care. Uh, a tremendous amount of money was cut uh, by the state government to subsidize insurance for people. Many people live in communities where the, the nearest clinic or hospital is very far away. They don't have access to them. And so people were dying prematurely at a much higher rate than they were in other places. And so that gap is actually going the wrong direction, only in Wisconsin. We have the third worst unemployment ratio in the country. So the unemployment rate for whites is 3.9%, 11.6% for blacks. But that's not really an accurate number. Because what happens is there are several measures of unemployment. The one that you always hear on the news, the unemployment rate dropped to a low of 3.9% is not accurate. They don't count people who, who've given up looking for work. So really, you don't look at the unemployment rate as an accurate number. What you do is you look at the jobless rate, which is a number that the Labor Department doesn't like to talk about. And it shows that in Milwaukee in 2015, in the city of Milwaukee, the jobless rate for black males over the age of 16 was 53%. 53% were not working. Wisconsin has the second worst labor force participation rate gap between blacks and whites. The white rate is 67%, the black rate is 61%. Please, public library is closing promptly at 8 o'clock. Do you have any materials to check out? Please do so now. To give you an idea of how bad those numbers are, the workforce participation rate for white men in 1972 in Milwaukee, when the economy was still thriving with big manufacturing plants, was 95% for white males. It's dropped to 67% for the state. The labor force participation rate for black males in the city of Milwaukee in 1972 was 85%. So by far, a majority of black and white men had employment and typically uh, pretty good jobs. That's changed. Wisconsin has the third worst gap in median family income. Median family income for whites is 58,000. It's less than or just over 29,000 for blacks. So median, that means if you take everybody's incomes and you put them in order from the least to the highest, the median is a point right in the middle. So that means that 58,000, that means half of white people are making 58,000 or more, half are making less than 58,000. For blacks, half of black people are making over 29,000, half are making less than 29,000. That's significant. In addition to that, Wisconsin has the third highest white black child poverty rate gap. 11.6% of white children in the state are living in poverty. Over 44% of black children in the state of Wisconsin are living below the government's fish poverty, which is another number that's not really a real number. 
because they very rarely adjust the threshold that they use. The threshold for poverty in a state or in the country based on the Department of Labor for family of four is $24,000. So if you're making less than $24,000, you're considered to be in poverty for a family of four. Imagine $24,000 for a family of four. That's not taking you very far. And the crazy thing about it is that we all know that it costs way more money to live in Chicago than it does to live in, say, Sturdivant, Wisconsin, or to live in Gary, Indiana, or any other city. San Francisco is the most expensive place in the country, but the poverty threshold is the same in San Francisco as it is anywhere else. My hometown of Mississippi, poverty threshold is $24,000. The average house there, the rent is like $300 a month. The average rent in San Francisco is like $2,500 a month. But the poverty threshold is the same. So once again, it's a number that's really not a relevant number. So I'm going to conclude by telling you some of the things that you can do to help with this problem. Number one, lobby your elected officials to enforce the open housing laws that are on the books. We don't need new laws. We always say, well, we need a law to do. No, we don't. We have the laws in place. We just need to enforce the laws that are there. And our elected officials in Milwaukee have done a very poor job. Uh, the elected officials around the country, quite frankly, have done a very poor job of prioritizing open housing. Create a committee that welcomes newcomers of all races and sub you know, social economic groups. People are afraid that when poor people move to the neighborhood, that the neighborhood is going to go down the toilet. Wake up, people. Stop being stupid. It's not the case. Everybody wants pretty much the same things. When you look at neighborhoods that are in poor condition, it's typically in poor condition because it's been that way for an extended period of time. Neighborhoods don't go to crap overnight. Neighborhoods go to crap because people lose jobs. It's impossible for people who used to make $30 an hour at a factory to go down to $89 an hour and still have the same standard of living. They're not going to be able to take care of that house in the same way. So that's why you have deterioration. Understanding concentrated poverty caused by segregation impacts the tax base of the city and county. Concentrated pockets of poverty around the country impact everybody in that community. Even the people that don't live in those concentrated poverty neighborhoods, you're still impacted. Poverty is very expensive for people who aren't living in poverty. Somebody has to pay for all of the activities that take place to help uplift people in those poor places. Do what you can to improve the conditions of the poor parts of the community. I, I always caution people that there are things we can all do to help you know, our poor neighbors, uh, to assist them, uh, getting them access to things that they don't have access to. Um, assisting them by advocating for them. Uh, you know, one of the things that happens a lot, and it happened in Sherman Park neighborhood, the Sherman Park is a weird place. So we have uh, some families who make significant amounts of money who live in Sherman Park. And then you have very poor families who live very, very close to them, maybe a block or two away. Uh, you have big, pretty homes, and you have, you know, smaller homes that are in bad shape and disrepair with very poor people living in them. Uh, and, and what you find is that people assume that the entire neighborhood is one particular way. And what I always caution people about is that those people who are living uh, in those poor parts of the city, they need assistance. They don't need you to come in and tell them how to fix stuff. They want you to come in and assist them because they want to fix their own neighborhoods. They don't need some superhero flying in with a blue cape on and fixing everything for them. They simply want you to be there uh, assisting them in the process, not telling them what they need. They know what they need. Recognize that segregation impacts all of us in any way. I mentioned earlier that for the most part, white people live in communities that are almost completely white. And as a result, they don't get to know people of color. They don't know Native Americans. They don't know Asians. They don't know blacks. They don't know Latinos. And so they live their lives based off of these images, these stereotypes of these people. And they base all the decisions about how to see these people based on these stereotypes. I tell people all the time that some people are very uncomfortable using the term black to describe black people. Listen, I like black better than African American because it comes off my lips a lot easier. And I don't see nothing wrong with the word black. Black is beautiful. I, I heard that when I was a little boy in Mississippi, and it's still a beautiful word. But what happens is people are afraid to even say the word. I hear people whisper, 
They were talking about black people and said, you know those black people around the corner? Why are you whispering the word black? I even know a guy that will whisper white. A black guy. Yeah, you know the white people around the corner. Like, dude, why are you whispering, man? It's okay to call people whatever, you know, whatever term they prefer. Some people prefer African American, some people prefer Afro American, some people prefer black. It doesn't make a difference to me. But what happens is not what you call people, what happens is how you see people and the perceptions you have of them based on this label that we've given people, which is a label that people don't give themselves for the most part. Be cognizant that many of the negative demographic indicators are directly related to poverty caused by job losses, not a lack of people desiring to work. I work for a workforce services company. I've been working there since April. I used to be a, a teacher, special education teacher for nine years. And I've gone from helping those young people to helping their parents find work. And there are a significant number of people that are looking for work. When the Great Recession hit in 2008 in the city of Milwaukee, and I'm sure it was very similar here in Racine, for every available job, there were six people looking for work. That was when the Great Recession hit. Afterwards, that number went significantly higher. And in many places, those economies have recovered to a certain extent, but that, that mix of available jobs versus people looking for work is still out of balance. And so we continue to blame people for not having jobs, um, and it's just not fair. Uh, I, I usually chastise uh, some of our, our older uh, members of our community in Milwaukee who grew up working at Alice Chalmers and A.O. Smith and things of that nature and having these great jobs and working there for 30 years and retiring with a pension and all these other things. I said, listen, man, these young people today don't have the opportunities you had. You could have dropped out of school at 16, went to Ailes Smith, told them you were 18, got a job, worked there for 35 years, got a pension, bought a nice Cadillac, bought a nice house, sent all your kids to college. You didn't need any education. These kids don't have those opportunities. There are no A.O. Smiths and Alice Chalmers and Briggs and Stratton and AMC Motors and all of that. Those places don't exist. And so the opportunities are not the same. Stop chastising people. Stop pretending that people are out of work because they don't want to work. Now some people, there's a handful of people that don't want to work. But for the most part, if you want to eat, you got to work. And so I'm hoping that, that you all understand kind of the history of the mechanisms that created segregation and the fact that segregation was not something that happened accidentally. It was something that was planned and carried out and it's impacting people to this day. Thank you all. Any questions? We only have a couple minutes. Yes. In reiterating all these things of the former years when these laws were created, has there ever been any um, reflection of which parties were in, in um, control of the go of federal government at the time? Um, does it make any difference whether, you know, like we say now, the Republicans are in, this is going to happen? Have they ever diagnosed, was it worse during some administrations than others? Absolutely not. Republican administrations, Democratic administrations in the White House and Congress, it didn't matter. Um, in fact, uh, if you look, um, many of these policies that were carried out and were written into, you know, allowed to happen, uh, which began in the, in, the, in the 20s and 30s, uh, the party that was in charge of Congress for the most part at that time were actually Democrats, the Southern Democrats who eventually began to refer themselves as Dixiecrats, so Southern Democratic Senators uh, were in charge of creating many of these programs. I'll give you another example of, of something they created. Uh, Social Security Act in 1935, Unemployment Insurance Act of 1935 were created under uh, the behest of Southern Democratic Senators who were in charge of Congress. But what they did is they put a clause in that said that people who were domestic workers or farm workers were ineligible for Social Security and for unemployment insurance. Guess what? 85% of black people lived in the South. And the majority of those, probably about 60%, were either domestic workers or farm workers. So from 1935 to 1954, most black people in the country were not eligible to put money into Social Security or to collect any unemployment and that was under Democratic leadership. So, uh, Democrats, Republicans, it, all the same, to the most, I mean, 
it's sad to say that, but if you look at the history, it hasn't made a difference. Both parties have been complicit. Do you have any opinion on this Foxconn? Foxconn is a trick. We're being duped into giving money to billionaires once again. Just like in Milwaukee, we're giving $480 million to the owners of the Milwaukee Bucks and they consistently tell you that they're billionaires. Listen, man, if you got billions of dollars, why do you need our money? So it's no different with Foxconn. Foxconn is coming in and taking advantage of subsidies. It, listen, let me tell you what, you know, they call it subsidies to make it sound good. It's welfare. It's corporate welfare. We complain about people getting a hundred and, you know, sixty dollars a month for food stamps, but we're giving these people hundreds of millions of dollars a year to build a factory which they will make no promises in terms of the number of people that will be working there. They claim that the average wage will be over fifty thousand dollars, but guess what? If you have the top ten people making two million, and the workers make it nine million, the average probably will be about fifty thousand dollars. But Foxconn has consistently around the country made promises that they didn't keep. They initially said that this plant they were building in Wisconsin would employ thirty thousand people. Those numbers have continued to drop and now they won't even say how many people are going to be employed. So those of us who are excited about Foxconn coming, you're being thrown into a trap because you are guaranteed to be disappointed. Uh, it's a, just another example of corporate welfare. Uh, and this happens at the behest of Republicans as well as Democrats. Uh, there's been some pushback. Um, a few state senators that I'm very good friends with have talked incessantly about how this is a very, very bad deal, but it's going to happen regardless. And we will find out several years down the road that we got screwed. Any other questions? Now, anyone who knows me, <laughs> I grew up in a little town in Mississippi, right next door to my great grandparents. And one of the things that I learned as a little boy was the value of honesty, being brutally honest. And I, I don't go out and do these presentations to, to make people feel good or to make people feel bad. I just give you the information and, and have you evaluate that yourselves. But one of the things that I think is most valuable for us is that because of how we've been educated as a nation and where we continue to educate our children, we're doing a horrible job of creating people that understand what's really going on around them. People watch the news, they read the newspaper, they get news from the internet, but we don't have the time or the energy to really dig deeply into these things. And we depend on our elected officials to give us this information, but listen, elected officials, and I know just about every elected official in the city of Milwaukee, I'm friends with many of them, I tell them this to their face all the time. Listen, man, what your primary concern is after you get elected is re-election. And we know this is how it works. So if we elect elected officials and we tell them that this is what we want you to do, this is what they should do. But in many cases, they don't. And then we say, well, we're going to get rid of those rascals. And then we vote for some more people who make the same promises or similar promises. And then they get in office and do the same thing. How many of you guys know who Evan Bayh is? Former governor of the state of Indiana. He left the governorship of Indiana and ran for the U.S. Senate, became a senator for the state of Indiana. And back in the early 2000s, he was considered to be uh, a very upcoming uh, progressive leader in the Democratic Party. He was seen as a person who would be the most viable candidate for the Democrats as president in 2016. This was in the early 2000s, right? He went to Congress as a senator. He served one term and he quit. You know why he quit? He said, when I got to Washington, D.C., I thought that I could do all of these things for my constituents, but when I got there, I found out it's such a hornet's nest, it's so messy, you can't get anything done for real there. He says, it's absolutely ridiculous. And he says, I would be better off serving my constituents in the public sector than in the private sector. He was very honest, very brutally honest. He was criticized, you know, Democrats were very disappointed in this man. Um, and then when he got back into the private sector, he realized shortly thereafter that there were ramifications for his decision there as well. And he tried to run again in Indiana and he lost soundly. So we have a system 
that is not a system that's conducive to elected officials doing what's best for their constituents. They do what's best for the people who support their campaigns. You know, we may give a dollar when we do our taxes to the election campaign, but there are entities that give large amounts of money. And we know, the politicians realize, you know, where the grease is coming from. We're not greasing their palms. The people that are are the ones that get the benefits. So it doesn't matter if it's Republicans or Democrats um, because we don't hold them accountable. I always say that we make such a point of telling people, you, you should vote. If you don't vote, you don't have a right to complain. Nonsense. I say, if you're taking taxes out of my check, I got a right to complain. This is the thing about voting that people forget. Voting is a simple act. You could train a monkey to go and vote. Right? What's important is not the act of getting into the little booth and checking the boxes for the candidates that you choose. The important thing is being an educated enough person that, guess what? I voted for this alderman, I voted for this state senator, I voted for this congressman. Most people in Wisconsin don't even know who their state senators are. They don't know who their alder person is. They don't know who their members of Congress are in Washington, D.C. And the reason why I say that the voting is the easy part, following these elected officials afterwards is the part that's most important. And the group that does that better than any other group, that votes in the highest percentage and holds people more accountable than any other group, are elderly people. Y'all holding it up. You're the only group consistently that's holding our elected officials accountable. The rest of us are just running around, voting willy-nilly, and not holding anybody responsible. The elderly community in the United States is the most active political group. We're not at all of these political rallies, but we're writing letters to the senator. You know, we ain't sending emails or text messages or sending something on Twitter. The only people are sending, they're, they're, writing, they're getting a piece of paper and a pen and an envelope and a stamp, and they're writing letters, and guess what? They read those letters. They will answer your letters. They don't care about what you tweet. They don't care about some stupid text message or email that you send. Those things are irrelevant. The people that hold them accountable are the people that are the voters that count. This is why I tell people, doesn't matter about voting if you're not going to do what happens after voting. If you're not going to be uh, an active participant in the process after voting, then you may as well say you wasted your vote. You have to hold them accountable. And we have not done a good job of that. I, I remember hearing this joke years ago. Richard Pryor, my favorite comedian, he was very vulgar. But he used to say a lot of intelligent things. And he said this in, in one um, show. He said, you don't get to be old being a fool. Y'all, a lot of young people, dead as a door now. And what he was basically telling us is that we have a lot to learn from our elders. And that was one of the things that I value uh, tremendously from my childhood, growing up around the elders in my family. My great-grandparents live right next door. And I learned a lot from them in terms of how to see the world and how to interact with the world. And so I challenge all of you who are the elders in your family, pull them little young whippersnappers to the side and teach them something because they're not learning, not the things that are important. They can show you how to work a $1,000 iPhone, but they can't tell you much beyond that. So those of you who are doing that, keep up the good work. I admire you, and I will always uplift the elders in our community. I was raised to admire the elders, and I guess for my students, they used to call me an old dude, which didn't bother me because, you know, I'm 51. I'll be 52 in two weeks. And I feel good for 51. So I'm going to keep on keeping on. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate you guys. And I'll be back.